G'day you mob, how's it going? Welcome to this episode of Aussie English, the number one place for anyone and everyone are wanting to learn Australian English. Now, I have a very special episode for you today where I am answering one of my followers' questions. Now, Azalia, thank you so much for your question, first of all. She sent me a message on Instagram and it read as the following. Hey, Pete, thank you for your channel and videos. They're really helpful. I have a question regarding grammar. How can I improve my grammar in my conversation? I know the basics, but when I'm talking to others, I get stressed and I can't use them properly. Thank you. So, I thought this was a really awesome question and I was really keen to talk about it on the podcast here because I know that it is the kind of thing that many of us struggle with. Not just you guys, but I struggle with this in Portuguese and French. And I think Azalia is referring mostly to when she says um, grammar in her conversation. I have a feeling that she's talking about sort of spoken English and how the changes occur. I mean, she may be talking about, and, and forgive me, Azalia, if I'm getting this wrong, grammar in general. But one of the things that I'm sure you guys have noticed in the course of learning English is that the grammar you learn in the classroom or from a textbook is quite often different from the grammar that gets used on the ground, right? When you are actually with other speakers of that language, of English, when you are speaking with them um, one-on-one, one-to-many in groups, I'm sure that you'll all have noticed rules can change. And I've, I've written down a few notes here that we'll go through, but I was actually thinking about this very topic, which is what spurred me on to make this video for Azalia today. I had it sort of sitting away, but I was like, you know what? I've just thought of this. And I was chatting with um, Charlie from the British English podcast, and we're working on things together. I'm helping him with his podcast and his courses and his platform. And I simply sent a little uh, sentence to him checking if something, uh, a link that I had sent him had worked. And all I said after I sent him the link was, that work? That work? Question mark. And I realized, ooh, this is some spoken grammar that is sort of breaking the rules, right? It's a kind of contraction of the larger sentence, does that work? And this is something that we do in English all the time when speaking, when we are asking people questions and we're using auxiliary verbs at the front of these questions like, are you at home? Um, Have you had tea? Uh, Does that work? What we can do is actually get rid of either the auxiliary verb and or the pronoun and just say, at home, had dinner, that work. But you would never do this writing. Okay. So, anyway, that's sort of a, a sort of a detour. But that's what had me thinking about this question from Azalia. Again, thank you so much for asking it. And writing down some points here for you guys on how you can improve your spoken English to sound much more natural. Because when we sort of- you you learn these grammatical rules out of the book. But if you start speaking all the time, especially in informal situations, and you're always using this very sort of formal version of grammar that is- that is correct. If you always speak that way, it can be a little weird, right? It's kind of- um, and I'm sure it's the same in your languages. There's a certain way that is sort of correct when uh, writing, when reading, but when speaking and interacting with people generally informally, a lot of the rules get broken to speed things up and to make them sound more natural. All right. So, point number one here. Conversational English often breaks grammatical rules. Now, we've talked about this moments ago where often words are missed out in, say, questions like that. The auxiliary verb and the pronoun can just be dropped because it's much quicker to just say that work. This often happens, obviously, in a a one-to-one conversation with another person where the pronoun's not required because it's obvious who you're talking to and you don't need that auxiliary verb at the front either because the conjugation of the verb at the end of the sentence um, shows what that auxiliary verb would have been. So, it's just speeding the process up. 
This happened to me in Portuguese, so learning Portuguese and the way that it is spoken is even worse than in English, I think, with the changes that occur. And I just had to spend a lot of time chatting with my wife and sort of parroting what she was saying to me and trying to absorb all these little changes that she was making to the language and undoing all of this formal grammar that I'd learnt. So, the first thing here is being aware of the fact that the grammar that you learn in books is by and large the stuff that is sort of officially correct in the language and will be used formally in writing and, and, and in speaking formally sometimes too. But be aware that rules get broken in informal English when spoken, especially in conversations with multiple people, okay? It's, a, it's one thing to be giving a speech, you're pro especially if you've written it, you'll probably write that with very good grammar, that's very correct. But if you're just having a spontaneous conversation with someone, likely it's, it's likely that you are going to um, make some shortcuts, okay? So, little tip number one here is just be aware of the fact that conversational English is often going to break a lot of these rules and you just have to get used to that, okay? Tip number two, <clears throat> you're going to have formal spoken English and you're going to have informal spoken English and you're probably going to have a bunch of gradations all the way through there, right? Depending on the kind of person you're speaking with, depending on the kind of situation you're in, depending on the education of, of you, of the person you're speaking with. There are many of these different factors that are going to have an effect on the sort of register of language that you're going to use, whether it's English, whether it's your native language, I'm sure it happens in every single language, but you're going to have this kind of continuum from formal, very, very formal, all the way down to informal. And now, like a good example of this might be if I went to Britain tomorrow and met with the Queen, I am going to speak in a very, very polite, grammatically correct, as grammatically correct a way as possible with the Queen of England, right? That's about the poshest example I can come up with where I would be on my uh, grammatical best behaviour, I want to say, where I would be doing my best to not make a fool of myself and to be as sort of polite and educated as possible. If, on the other hand, I went into the outback in Australia and I was working on a farm, you know, with some, um, you know, really authentic rural Aussies who aren't really surrounded by that kind of, you know, people like the Queen very often and don't speak that way and instead have a much more informal way of speaking with one another. I'm going to change my English to speak much more like that so that I fit in and I feel part of the group than I am going to use the English that I would use in front of the Queen. Okay, so tip number two here is really just being aware of the fact that there are going to be gradations, right? There's going to be different levels of grammar change in the language. You're going to speak a certain way in very formal situations, even though some of the grammatical rules may still change and, you know, you use contractions and things like that uh, in formal situations, but it may happen even more in informal situations. And an example of this might be uh, in Australian English, you'll, you'll hear people say use which is kind of like a pluralization of the word you, which is already plural. And it's kind of used by, and, you know, I don't want to say uneducated people, but it's, it's very informal. It tends to be used in non- Non-formal situations, you're never going to be taught to do that at school. You're never going to be taught to do that at university, but it tends to be a very informal kind of lower class way of speaking. I mean, you know, I've done it before. I used it when I was much younger. Kids will use it, but it's something that I think would be much more common in rural environments. And I would probably start saying it if I heard other people saying it to use things like use to change my grammar there uh, instead of saying you. And another example might be that sometimes you'll encounter people who say uh, instead of those ones or these ones, they'll say them ones. So, can you give me them ones over there? Can you give me them ones? Another sort of grammatical change. It's not really wrong or right. You know, I mean, ultimately, when you speak to a linguist, you'll find out that grammar, there's no correct grammar and wrong grammar. There just is grammar and it just changes depending on 
groups and, and dialects and everything like that. But you'll see those changes happen. So, if I was hanging out with a bunch of tradies in Australia, a bunch of guys, you know, blokes hanging out with one another working together, they're much more likely to be using that kind of conversational grammar that's very informal. You know, what are yous doing? Can you give me th- them ones over there? Go to the shops later. Another thing is you might notice pronunciation changes. So, instead of saying going to the shops later, they may say go to the shops later, go to the shops. Um, so, there you go. That is point number two. Be aware of the fact that there is going to be this change in formality um, depending on the group, depending on the person and that grammar can change as a result of that too. And that individuals like myself subconsciously become aware of that and can kind of apply the different grammars. Um, in the different situations. It's just something you've got to practice, but we'll get into that in a sec. So, point number three here, discovery of this grammar, right? How do you study these, these forms of grammar? How do you learn these forms of grammar? The first thing I would say is that you need to find natural conversations from these sort of different groups, right? We've, di- we've just discussed that you're going to have um, informal to formal versions of spoken grammar that sort of break these rules. Obviously, if you want to become exposed to it and you want to learn it, you need to find content that you can study. So, what kind of content is going to have natural conversations um, that are both formal and informal? Some really good places to start are obviously TV series. So, I would say get on Netflix, get on Amazon Prime, get on the local TV network and, I mean, if you're in Australia or America or Britain, Find some TV shows, but find TV shows that tend to be dramas where you're going to have a lot of these one-on-one conversations in natural kind of environments where people are having these short conversations about different daily things and they're going to be breaking these grammar rules, okay? So, find a bunch of different kinds of TV shows. You could find TV shows, you know, a good example might be finding a show like Shameless from the US or from Great Britain to find out how the kind of lower class um, versions of uh, the the populations over there use that in really informal language and how they break the grammatical rules when speaking informally. And then I might do something like find a political drama like uh, West Wing, you know, or the, the newsroom. And then you'll get to see how politicians and, you know, the the people who are in their sort of work environments are going to use more formal um, conversational English. So, TV shows are a great place to start. Another one is re- reality TV shows, you know, things like Big Brother, although I, you know, and, you know, The Bachelor, all those sorts of things. I don't really watch them, but they are definitely a good place to go if you want to learn this kind of conversational English. Podcasts. Podcasts like the Aussie English podcast are a great place to look for these kinds of conversations. Obviously, you need to find things like interviews or discussions. And again, informally, I would look for discussions amongst friends or family or, you know, loved ones. Like on my podcast, anytime I chat with my wife, my friends or my dad, I'm going to be using much more informal conversational English. But on the episodes where I'm interviewing things like authors or celebrities or whoever it is that I've brought onto the podcast that I don't know very well, if at all, I'm going to be using a more formal version of conversational English with that that kind of grammar and those kinds of contractions, okay? So, again, it's having a balance of those different things. Lastly, on this point number three, get transcripts or subtitles. So, make sure that you can actually see the words being used, that you can read the phrases because that's going to- help it stick in your mind, you can take notes, you can do all that sort of stuff that's really going to help you implement the stuff that you're trying to learn. And that brings us to point number four, implementation. So, obviously, if you want to learn anything, studying it is one thing, being aware of it is one thing, but you need to go and implement it. You need to go and try the, th- the thing that you're trying to learn, right? You, you can't really learn to run a marathon by watching YouTube videos or, you know, learn to become an MMA fighter or to, I don't know, play chess by just watching tutorials or videos of other people doing that thing. You need to go and actually practice those techniques or the things that you're learning in a kind of safe environment 
and improve your skills that way, sort of internalize it that way. So, what would you do in terms of trying to level up your spoken grammar, informal, formal, whatever it is? I would say that I would be obviously doing point number three where I'm studying it. I'm watching the tutorials. I'm consuming the content. I'm taking notes. I'm thinking, oh, these sentences, these phrases are really interesting. I'm going to write those down and try and use them. I'm going to get feedback from other people when I use these in conversation. I would be practicing these on my on my own. So, a good way, obviously, of internalizing how to say certain sentences naturally without having to think about them is by writing them out, finding them, learning them, and then saying them with your mouth and getting the mouth muscles connected to the brain so that it's much more effortless to say. And and one of these examples that I have from French, when I was studying French in year 12, we were practicing for an oral exam where we had to have a conversation. And to this day, I still have one of these phrases stuck in my mind that I practiced again and again and again. And the phrase was, ce qui me le plus intéressé, which effectively just meant what interest- what interested me most about- and then you could go into a phrase about whatever it was. Ce qui me le plus intéressé, yeah, me le plus intéressé, what interested me most. I- I did many repetitions of that on my own. I looked in the mirror. I was in my bedroom. And then when it came to going to the oral exam, I could just whip it out when they would say something like, you know, what do you like doing uh, in summer? And I'd be like, the thing that interests me most about summer is the fact that you can go to the beach, that you can hang out with your mates, blah, 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 blah. So, practicing those kinds of phrases that you've learnt first and getting your muscles used to saying them so that you can just whip them out naturally in conversation is a must. The next thing here is to aim to practice these new phrases, words, grammatical structures in conversation every single day, right? So, whether you are at work, whether you are ordering food from people in a shop, whether you're hanging out with mates, anytime you're having these one-to-one interactions, you should be trying to use what you've learned. You know, pick a few phrases or a few grammatical structures a day, practice those. See if you can do as many as possible, you know, repetitions of those same phrases so that you can internalize them as much as possible and then go home, do the same thing the next day with a different bunch of phrases. Lastly, okay, point number five, the very last one that I have here for you is reflective practice. Now, this is one of the most important things when it comes to learning any kind of task, holding on to it and improving that task, okay? Whether you are trying to become a good weightlifter, this is what I'm trying to do at the moment and improve my technique there. Whether you're trying to learn chess, whether you're trying to become an MMA fighter or whether you're trying to level up English or any other language. Point number five here is reflective practice. So, you need to reflect on the practice you've done. You need to then look for the mistakes you've made or look for the areas that you could improve in. And then next time when you go out to practice again, the subsequent time, you try and make those improvements or make those changes and then you repeat this process, right? And it becomes kind of like compound interest in terms of your improvement. So, every single day, if you go and chat with people and you practice certain phrases and then they, you know, they give you a sort of that dog look of looking sideways like they're confused, you might ask them, oh, did I say something a bit confusing? What's a better way of saying it? And they may correct you and say, oh, try saying this next time. It's much more natural. Then you can write that down, go away, remember that, try that the next day and just keep repeating this process, right? The last little bit here that I should mention is- and it's sort of tied in with confidence as well. Embracing your mistakes. Now, it's a bit of a cliche. I know lots of English teachers and language teachers are are always saying, embrace your errors, you know, to build confidence, you need to be proud of your mistakes. Leaving the sort of cliche stuff aside, what I would be doing is just trying to develop a positive mindset when it comes to mistakes and thinking every single time you make a mistake, Use that moment with with someone, with another person, especially if they look confused or they pick you up on it and say, what do you mean? Ask them how you could do that better. So, use that mistake as a way of getting 
instant improvement, instant feedback so that you can improve, okay? Because that's really what's going to help you improve quickly. And as a result of not worrying about the mistakes and improving at the same time, you're going to build confidence rapidly, right? That happened to me in Portuguese. I moved into a house with five other Portuguese speakers when we were living in Canberra a few years ago. For the first few months, I was terrified of speaking. In fact, it was probably about a month. I just hated it because every time I opened my mouth, I made a mistake. But I kept asking for feedback. I kept having to push through that uncomfortableness, getting to the edge of my comfort zone and just constantly, unashamedly asking for feedback. Okay, how can I say this more naturally? Um, What's a good way of saying this? If this is what I'm trying to say, is there a natural phrase or a better way of saying this that sounds natural? Um, Just getting over worrying about making mistakes, but then also using any mistake that you make as a way to instantly fortify that thing, you know, fix that thing in the moment, ask for feedback. What's a better way of doing it? How can I do this correctly? Locking that away and then moving forward, okay? You're going to improve your English and you're going to build confidence at the same time. So, there we go. That That's sort of my uh, long answer to Azalea's question. I hope you guys have enjoyed this episode. If you have some questions for me, please feel free to leave them in the comments below and I will see you next time. Peace out.